So thank you. I wanted to thank Chris and, and Ricky and Damian for having me here. I think it's, uh, I, I come from another community. It's not exactly the transport community, right? It's more the plasmonics and nano optics community. So that's what I pretend to share today in a tutorial spirit. So maybe going too basic, you tell me, but uh, I was told to, to do it like that. And uh, this is pretty much our object of interest is a metal insulator, metal cavity, where we are going to put eventually our molecules. So far with conduction or no conduction, but uh, we typically come with light and uh, a big interaction between photons and uh, nano antenna plasmons and vibrations and excitons and currents happen. And this is some of the things that our theory group in San Sebastian tried to address either integrally or partially, most of the times partially, right? Um, an important aspect of, of the talk that you will see as it comes through is that on top of uh, giving this tutorial about uh, light matter interaction in plasmonic cavities, the under, underlying aim of the talk is, is to show you how we can bring now nanophotonics to the, to the atomic scale for the transport community to do things at the atomic scale is trivial since uh, 30 years ago, right? You have your electron current, which is localized within angstroms, and you have your resolution. But in photons uh, and in optics, you know that the diffraction limit typically limits this, this ability to, to localize light. And with plasmonic structures, as I will show you, we managed, or historically, we managed to localize light within 5 to 10 nanometers. And now, like Guillaume Schul will show you in the, in the next talk, now we stand, well, maybe not standardly, because these are some of the best groups in the world, but uh, the best groups in the world now get atomic resolution in fluorescence of molecules. Okay? So my talk today will show you why that is like that and why it kind of contradicted in the beginning the plasmonic knowledge and how it's actually quite simple if you think twice about it, right? When we think of photonics at the atomic scale, which was even three, four years ago, was unthinkable and thought not to be possible, I, I was collecting for this tutorial old papers and, and I found this actually a PRL with Richard Brandt when I was a postdoc in, in Chalmers of 2002. And, and the amazing thing is the title, right? Electromagnetic coupling on an atomic scale. And, and already at that time, Richard Brandt was putting a, an STM cavity and uh, under operation with a bias of two, three electron volts, a couple of electron volts. They were recording the, the photons emitted. And when they were arriving to an atomic uh, uh, site uh, step, they were recording the, the emission and they could see a jump in the spectrum, a jump of about two, three nanometers in, in wavelength, very little. But this allowed to, us to tell that subatomic scale modifications of the tip sample region cause spectral shifts of the fluorescence as demonstrated on a monatomic step. So actually, I don't know if you knew this, Guillaume, but uh, 20, almost 20 years ago, we were reporting the first atomic scale resol resolve structures, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this is the kind of things we, we calculated. We saw that you get to an atomic uh, scale and you get the kinks in the, in the signal and, and spectrally uh, they could measure. This is just peak position in wavelength, okay? This is optics. So instead of EB, we measure very typically in, in nanometers and a couple of nanometers shift when you get to the topographic atomic scale, right? This was, I thought it was kind of funny to find this uh, 20 years later when, when everybody figured this was not possible, right? This is what I'm planning to do today, and I told uh, the chairman that I will renormalize. Okay, so I will give a very basic introduction on plasmonics. I will focus on the plasmonic nano gap because it's the most interesting and important plasmonic structure, particularly when it comes to conduction and molecular spectroscopy. We'll pay attention to quantum effects, photoemission in these nano gaps, which is something we have found lately. Also, atomistic effects, which is what uh, the key to resolution, atomic scale resolution in optics. And finally, this is where we put the molecules and we try to measure this interplay between transport and optics. I will try to do uh, this in the last part of the talk. This last, the molecular electrominescence in nanogaps, Guillaume will cover, so I probably will skip it. And, and he will tell us better and with more time about it. Okay, so let's start little by little. I also plan to do a break uh, of one or two minutes in half an hour so that you breathe and don't stretch legs. But uh, I mean, to listen to somebody for one hour is after uh, at siesta time, it's very tough for you and for me. So we will stop two minutes, okay? So make it until then. The context of uh, plasmonic and metal insulator metal cavities in optics is, is the following. 
uh, people have been using in optics, optical cavities basically to enhance light matter interaction. What does that mean? If you have a molecule, and the same way you can do vibrational spectroscopy with STM or whatsoever, with light you can also excite vibrational and excitonic states of molecules and, and prove them to a spectroscopy, right? And this has a cross section which is larger or smaller depending on the molecule, and if you do it in naked, in the absence of any help, this has a relatively low rate of, of excitation and emission. Right? And then, as we know, uh, people have been using optical mirrors, basically with two uh, goals. Uh, to make uh, the light to spend more time interacting with the matter you put in your resonator, right? instead of passing once, <laughs> you make it pass several times, then you improve the interaction. right? And this is typically governed by a, by a parameter called the quality factor. So how, how long the photon lives here before leaving, right? And these mirrors usually have a very large quality factors. Uh, three uh, million, several millions of quality factors. The, the other concept has to do with the space, right? The, you try, I mean, there's a, an electromagnetic energy dispersed when you interact with the, with the light, and by trapping light in a space, you condensate the, the resonator mode volume to a lower uh, volume and then you increase the electromagnetic density of energy, so you also improve the interaction with matter, basically because you put more photons in a more reduced space, right? So the matter feels more density of interaction. These are the two parameters, the effective mode volume that you try to reduce and the quality factor that you try to improve so that the photon spends a lot of time. So with these two simple concepts you improve, enhance the interaction of light and matter. And people talk about a resonator or optical enhanced light matter interaction, right? As I said, to improve these parameters requires changing of, of resonator, right? And in the last decades there has been a trend to try to reduce this effective mode volume going to this kind of micro resonators that you might have heard, right? These, these have more reduced effective mode volumes. Now you can put here your quantum dot or your resonate, your emitter and it actually feels more intensely, the, the electromagnetic density, right? And they preserve quite well the quality factor. Photons live quite long here as well. These are dielectrics. The ultimate uh, reduction of effective mode volume within diffraction limit is photonic crystals, right? You structure, like you do in condensed matter, in photonic structures, you structure your dielectrics so that you get a trap photonic state here. If you put your emitter here or your molecule, then you have almost the limit of reduction of the effective mode volume. Right? But with diffractive uh, optics, that's the best you can do. This is almost wavelength. So. To overcome this, then, is what we have with our cavities and our electrodes. Right? We can put a metal, insulator metal, and this in, in optics we will call an, a plasmonic cavity because we will have uh, electron collective oscillations here, building up an optical resonator that behaves pretty much like these ones, but with very particular values of effective mode volume and quality factor. The effective mode volume, thanks to the excitation of the electron gas, is reduced to the nanoscale. It beats the diffraction limit. But now it's not diffractive optics anymore. It's condensed matter excitations that bring, borrow energy and momentum from light, and for a while, for a few femtoseconds, they hold the photons here in very reduced effective mode volumes. Okay? But the drawback, the price to pay, is, of course, the quality factor. These resonators are built not by diffractive optics, but by condensed matter electrons, which have a lot of friction, have intrinsic losses, and then the bad news is that these photons here spend very little time. So after two, three optical cycles, a few femtoseconds, they just go away. They are very lossy. Okay? So it's a trade-off. Plasmonic cavities for optics work very well, trapping light in very reduced volumes, but they last for very little. Okay, that's the idea, too. and that's the context of plasmonic cavity. How Sometimes we, we call here plasmonic cavity because it's an actual physical cavity, right? But this is a, an optical resonator, a nanoscale optical resonator. Sometimes you don't even need in plasmonics the cavity. You can have a simple a spherical particle, you also oscillate with the collective uh, motion of the electrons and you produce this resonator. And if you put now an emitter here, it would work similar way. But then instead of talking about the plasmonic cavity, people talk about the plasmonic antenna, which is a, a resonator, right? So here in this case, the plasmonic antenna, because physically it's a cavity as well, we call it a plasmonic cavity. But you don't need to get confused. A plasmonic nano cavity, a plasmonic nano antenna is the same thing. It's just a trapper 
of light in the nanoscale. Okay? How does it uh, come that this is the way it is with metals and it traps light? Let's do a almost undergraduate course in, in two, three slides. This is the dispersion light of light, a straight light, right? Frequency is equal to speed of light by the momentum. There will be an N here in a medium. If now our metal is described by a dielectric function, a non-interacting electron, a plasma frequency, the this frequency dependence, this is a typical response of bulk of the dielectric function, and we inject this here, then what we get is what we call the plasmon polariton, right? Excitation matter. So the bulk of a metal will have a collective oscillation, a longitudinal oscillation, that behaves almost like light for large momentum, but then this has this prevention of lower energies, so light doesn't go below the frequency of the plasma. This is not so important for optics. You cannot excite this with optics. When surfaces come in, it's more interesting. We put surfaces here. Now it's a metal vacuum interface, and there is a solution, a surface wave between two interfaces, the electric mediums, which behaves like this. This is just solving Maxwell equations, you get this solution. And now if in this solution, in the metal, you put the, the drew the function, you get what we call the dispersion of a surface plasmon polariton, which is nothing but a surface charge density of the metal here propagating, propagating in time and space, right? And you can see how it's bounded also by the surface plasmon value. And this is pretty much the ID of this excitation at the surface. It's different, and, and here, I, sometimes I tell the, the undergraduates as well, when you talk about plasmons, it's very different to have a bulk plasmon or a surface plasmon, because these are two completely different identities in condensed matter, okay? For optics, this is going to be interesting, but not quite yet, not like this, because if somebody asks you, can you excite a surface plasmon like this, propagating in a perfectly infinite metal vacuum interface? The answer would be yes or no. If I have a metal with a drude, perfect, with a perfect semi-infinite medium, I come with light, with this, I'm gonna give you a hint, with this thing, you come and can you excite this? You need something, right? Because to exchange one type of uh, excitation into another, you need a matching of energy and momentum. And here there is no crossing, right? You cannot conserve energy and momentum at the same time between light and plasma. So light cannot excite a surface plasma, and a surface plasma cannot decay into light. Right? So why we study these kind of excitations in non-optics, in, in conductive junctions? Because the thing, the interesting thing comes when we take this infinite surface, which has this dispersion, and we close it and make it finite. Okay, I'm gonna take this. Topologically, it would be like a rod, right? But imagine it's like a wrapping of a particle, right? And we get this particle, which is a confined structure with a radius A, size A, and this closure of the geometry produces a bounded a stationary solution of this propagating wave, right? Like in any stationary wave uh, situation. But now, this geometrical matching produces a geometrical momentum, I could put here kg, a geometrical momentum, which is an integer, the number of, of rounds, divided by the size, right? This is the inverse, the momentum provided by the geometry is the inverse of the size. And now, in this geometry, in this finite structure, you can confine the plasmon, now it's not propagating in the surface, it's, it's oscillating in time, but it's confined in space, and this confinement in space produces the provision of geometrical momentum that allows to match photons and localized plasmons. Okay, so that's the reason why plasmonic structures, nanoantennas, finite structures, couple very well to light because of the drude, the, the metal response, plus the geometry. Both together give the confinement of light to sub or nanometer, or you will see sub nanometer dimensions, okay? So this is very interesting because this is basically the, the root of all nano-optics. This is not the standard way actually of, of showing lo localized surface plasma. You will see the polarizability of this particle when the, when the denominator is zero, you have a resonance, it's the same thing. What I'm bringing you is how the, rest, the finite, uh, discrete set of resonances emerges for a finite structure, right? 
This is the, the birth of, the nan of nanophotonics with plasmons, because now in this scale of nanometers, which matches the visible for metals like gold or silver, you will have fields localized in the nanoscale. Okay? Confinement of its beating the diffraction limit. But this is produced by the electronic excitations of the electron gas. Then you have enhancement, because of what I said, reduce effective mode volume, and tunability, depending on how you produce or, or, or change the size or the shape of this, you will match different resonator energies, and then you have tunability, okay? all the way from visible to infrared. So we have localization of light in the nanoscale, tunability, and enhancement of the fields. That's nanoptics. How does it work? We can do experiment. We have a nanoparticle, a nanoantenna, still not a nanocavity. We come with light. We check with the detector as a function of the, of the color, and we would see this resonance, right? This would be the dipolar resonance, and we can, see, we can do it. If we put the detector here, it would be extinction. If we put the detector on a side, it would be a scattering, right? Because once you come with light, and because of the through the plus the finite, you excite the plasmon, it's like in any condensed matter excitation, this plasmon, which lives for a few femtoseconds, has to die like any excitation. It has a lifetime, right? But it has to give its energy to something else, right? And the two mechanisms of giving energy is basically to scatter back again into a photon, which is a scattering, or to give energy to phonons and, and heat, right? Which is absorption. So this is the two types of uh, combining a scattering and, and a scattering and absorption, you give the whole extinction, right? So this is the plasmonic resonance, the localized surface plasmonic resonance. This is how it looks. This is the particle here. There's a pulse. This is a calculation of the electromagnetic energy density. And you can see this is the plasma. It's like a wave of charge density. This is energy. It will be positive, negative charge. But because it's energy, it shows positive both. And the particle will be here. And the pulse is coming like that. Okay? So you resonantly, because of the finite, for a particular frequency, you excite this electron gas. Yes. In the previous slide, uh, was it on a single molecule that absorption extinction? There's no molecule yet here. Sorry, not molecule, only nanoparticle. Single nanoparticle? Single nanoparticle. You can do this on a single, this in what is called dark field scattering. You put a detector here, and you can spread very dispersed nanoparticles. Look at this. Uh, you're going to see it now. So this is little nanoparticles. Even with an optical microscope, you can see them shining at their particular resonance, depending on the size. These are plasmonic antennas. Okay. Sometimes that's why I insist uh, people not to get confused with the terminology, right? Nano antennas, nano resonator, optical antennas, uh, uh, is the, the whole thing is the same. Nano resonators, that's it. And depending on the size and the shape, you will resonate at different frequencies, right? So that's it. Now we understand all this. The most important feature actually is not just the resonance, which is important. The most important features of nanoscale photonics is actually the localization of the field. If you make a picture of the, if you could make a picture of, of the plasma oscillating, this would be the kind of picture. Positive charge here, negative, oscillating like that, and we make a picture, and this would be the local field associated, localized in particles of 10 to 100 nanometers, are around 5 to 10 nanometers of localization. Okay. So we're getting closer to STM and resolution with electrons, but not quite yet. Okay. This is the summary of what I said. You have a nano resonator, you come with light, you excite on the first order the dipolar plasmon resonance, and this is how it looks. This is charge oscillating. So now it comes what might be more interesting for this uh, workshop, right? Now what we're gonna do in plasmon is something very important. Since this is charge, and charge interacts very efficiently with Pia Coulomb, we're gonna put another particle close to it, right? So when we put another particle close to it, the resulting resonance is not just the sum of, of both. It's a kind of hybridization of the resonance via this Coulomb interaction. What happens when you put another particle under the same illumination with the same polarization is this kind of positive, negative, positive, negative, an interaction via Coulomb in very, low, very short distances, a big interaction and a big localization of the near field. So if you put a cavity, one particle close to another, you are localizing even farther the standard nano antenna. Now you can talk about the proper plasmonic nano cavity, 
which is the ultimate case of plasmonic antenna. Okay? And this again, you can imagine that this can be a particle, or it can be a tip, and this can be our surface. So we have exactly the same phenomenology. Okay? The plasmonic nanogaps. So now you know we have a localized plasmons. When we put another particle, we localize even more, reduce the effective mode volume, and enhance even more. Right? This is the amplitude. About 10 times for a single particle is multiplied by 10 for a localized cavity. If you try to do this with a long particle, then you don't get it. You reduce again the field enhancement. It's a spread again. It goes to the infrared. It's really the interaction what makes. Sometimes we call this nano cavity, but we also call it gap antenna, okay? And, and to this, which is the large dipole, because there is charge transfer here through the metal, obviously there is metal here, we call it sometimes to this, we call charge transfer plasma, which is nothing but a longer dipole, okay? But it's because of this charge transfer, we call this charge transfer plasma and, and this gap antenna. Because of what I said before, that this resulting resonance is not just the sum of resonances, but the hybridization, Sometimes, in analogy to quantum chemistry, we call this gap antenna also bonding dimer plasma. So sometimes I think that we invent terminology to confuse people, right? Because all this is the same. So if you hear, oh, I, I, I excite a bonding dimer plasma. What is that? And it's this, okay? It's the gap plasma. Yes? So the, the one in the middle, the, the rod has to be limit length. If you increase the length of the two rod to really long, that, that's what would this be. Yeah. So if you make this longer and longer, this uh, energy, you, you will, I will show it in a second, this will shift a little bit. But if you preserve the radius and the, the characteristics here, you will localize in a similar effective mode volume. But you will shift the energy. So obviously mm -hmm. here I'm taking the pictures at the resonant position. So maybe I'm moving a little bit of color, okay? We're gonna see it now. Let me show you in a second here. So actually, this is important. Uh, the use of all these antennas or bonding diamond plasmas or gap plasma have been very important in molecular spectroscopy. Now we start putting, uh, it's, it's exactly what I said, right? I want to go a little bit faster because otherwise. So now I have this cavity with a localized field. I can do here current too, right? And now I want to put my molecule and I put my molecule, and, and what I'm doing is exactly what I said in the beginning, trapping energy, electromagnetic energy, into a nanoscale for a short time, because it will escape quickly, but now my molecules can interact very efficiently, right? So this is what people have done to prove excitons, homolumo transitions in molecules, or vibrations, right? You can do the same, enhance vibrational excitation, like in infrared absorption, in Raman, here in fluorescence. So if you do this, in vacuum or isolated, you talk about fluorescence or absorption or Raman scattering. If you put it inside a cavity or close to a plasmonic antenna, people call, talk about surface enhance. But now again, this is again one more terminology. Instead of surface enhance, you could use plasmon enhance or nano antenna enhance or plasmon cavity enhance. It's surface because, of course, here you have surface, right? This is, for example, this example. This is a, an antenna, a cavi antenna. There's hemoglobin here. Hemoglobin is quite big. You do the Raman, vibrations in this case, and this is the hot spot. We call them hot spots as well. Not thermal hot spot, but electromagnetic hot spot. And these hot sites are, are where you put the hemoglobin and you get all this signal emerging. And if you put the hemoglobin out of the hot spot, you don't get anything, right? So it's really enhanced. It works like an antenna, nano antenna. That's why we call them nano antennas. Now your question, how does this work? Spectrally, I mean, if you make the, the antenna larger or you change the distance, right? Because this is Coulomb interaction, I have this cavity, and now this is the distance between the two electrodes, right? You see, I'm changing now again terminology. I use the word electrodes because I'm here. Otherwise, I would never use the word electrode. The two nanoparticles, okay? There's two electrodes, actually. You put them closer together, and this now you name it, bonding dimer plasmon, or cavity plasmon, or nano antenna gap, whatever, it's red shifting. You put it closer and closer, the Coulomb interaction is larger and larger, and you just shift it, almost divergently, right? And if they match and, and connect, there is this charge transfer, it's not capacity, this is this one, okay? This is the bonding dimer plasmon, bonding gap, call it. If you connect, then there is charge transfer, and now you form a big, larger dipole, and it redshifts a lot, right? So it's like a discontinuity here. 
And if you keep superimposing, then you have blue shift, right? This doesn't exist because plasmons need to preserve net charge equal to zero. So this doesn't exist, right? But this exists because it's connected and this compensates this. So this is oscillating in the large scale. You have higher order modes. And so this is the spectral behavior of these uh, cavity plasmons, okay? We have actually, with Rainer Hillenbrand, a microscopist in San Sebastian, we did this experiment, right? To take a rod and to cut the middle little by little. And this is the calculation. I'll show you the experiment in a second. So here we have the rod, the original rod, with the big large dipole here, you see? And now you start cutting, etching the center, so less, letting less conductance, less conductance, until you cut it. And when you cut it, the bonding dimer plasmon emerges. Okay? This is, I tell you this because this is going to be important for molecular conduction later. So you have the charge transfer plasmon here, full rod connected, and when you cut it, then you have this bonding dimer plasmon. Here would be the bonding dimer plasmon, or gap plasmon would be here. And this would be the charge transfer, full, full charge. Okay? It works all this time. Because this is very long, it, it shifts. It shifts to, to the infrared. But it's the same concept, visible infrared. Okay? Now, all this you can do classically. I just show Maxwell equations, solutions of electromagnetic fields, the nanoscale. But what happens, and particularly in the conduction and molecular uh, molecular transport community, you are starting to get atomic scale configurations, right? Lithography, break junctions, we heard the, the talk on break junctions, electrochemistry, electromigration, <laughs> STN with junctions, molecular junctions here, self-assembly, we have heard a few here. All these features start uh, probing, accessing the atomic scale, right, of, of photonics as well, not only of, of transport. And particularly, the ones we have exploited, and these are the, the two types of, of a scheme to, to, to address this atomic scale photonics, is this top-down and this bottom-up approach. One is the ultra-high vacuum, low-temperature microscope, like the one that Guillaume will show you in, in a second. You put your molecules here, you bias, and you have a naturally good plasmonic cavity. Right? Now, on top of your conduction, if you send light in or check light out, light is going to be very enhanced and trapped in this bonding plasmon or in this nanocavity plasmon. So this is a very good playground to check the interplay between transport and photonic emission, fluorescence, lighting, and all that. Please don't tell everything. Sorry? Don't tell everything. Get a piece for me. <laughs> okay. The other op uh, approach is more bottom-up, right? It's uh, you put a metal, you deposit, deposit your self-assembled monolayers of molecules, like the ones Chris develops, the ones we have seen, which I, I told the other way, joking, that uh, this is a more dirty approach, right? Of course, you don't have ultra-high vacuum, it's not single molecule, low temperature. This is very often room temperature, self-assembly, a lot of dangling bonds. I but, you should not say dirty, but realistic. And I was told by Richard Van Dijn not to use the word dirty when it comes to wet chemistry self-assembly, but to use realistic, right? So realistic chemistry that gives a more down-to-earth system. On top of the self-assembly, you deposit a gold nanoparticle, and you create the same situation. We call this nanoparticle on a mirror. The mirror is the metal, right? And you create, if the self-assembled monolayer is one nanometer, you have a one nanometer cut plasmonic cavity. And you can send light in, check dark field microscopy. It's very hard to bias this. So people try, people are trying. In Cambridge, for example, Jeremy Bomber, now he showed me just last week that uh, they are starting to bias effectively, right? And this is something that you are an expert on too, right? Okay, so somehow we need to address theoretically the, the nanophotonics beyond the nanoscale, beyond the classical description, right? And for that, we will have to rely not on Maxwell equations and dielectric theory, but going more deeper into the electron gas response and develop quantum mechanical calculations for getting the response, right? There's other approaches that we use. We, we need to put the molecule here and we will use quantum chemistry to describe electronic and vibrational states. And I will not talk at all about this today because we also quantize the field in cavity QED fashion, and this gives coherences of the interactions with matter, nonlinearities, correlations in the statistics of emission. This, this is a completely different field. Right? Today I will just, I'm talking about this. So again, we have this. This is the kind of situation that Guillaume has. This would be the situation in the self-assembled monolayer as well. And uh, as I say, we need to go beyond classical descriptions. In the group, what we have done is go to this quantum mechanical model of the electron gas. We put the two boxes 
right? And, and then we have the wave functions. And uh, there was also a talk, a tutorial on, on, on density functional theory and time-dependent density functional theory. That's what we use to address, again, beyond classical description. Now what we want to see is what is the response to light of the electron gas moving in these two boxes, right? And, and that we do through the nonlinear time dependence radical equation solution through these Conisham orbitals that were described in the tutorial in the morning. This would be the Conisham mm. orbitals, your Hamiltonian with the kinetic energy, the potentials, exchange, correlation, you name it. And what you can basically, actually, we do it in time domain, not in frequency spin, in time domain. So what we are able to is to trace via the, Conish, the evolution in time of the Conisham orbitals of the electron gas to trace the, the electron density. And this electron density, which is basically this evolution is given via this propagator in time, gives you the, the time evolution of the charge density. If now you, well, this is how it works, you have a pulse, right, in blue, and then you can build the dipole created by this structure from the charge density evolution in time. If you multiply the charge density by space, right, you have the dipole. So this in red, you have the dipole, which is a response to the infrared pulse that comes in the, in the cavity. That's how it works methodologically. If you Fourier transform your dipole, well, that's, I think I have one, well, you get this kind of a spectrum, right? You, you Fourier transform and you will get the resonance. That's, that's how it works. I have one missing a slide here. You will have the spectrum, like the one I show experimentally, right? just the Fourier transform of, of this red. Okay? What is the axis? Yes? What is the axis? The axis is time, sorry, let's cut. Time, time of the pulse is an infrared pulse that comes in here. You let the electron gas with all the exchange correlations many body to go crazy in time, they follow. This is the red line. And now the red line you Fourier transform from time to frequency. And then in the frequency domain, you would get in the frequency domain, you would get a resonance, which is your plasma, okay? So before I stop uh, and for the midterm, I want to say by doing this, you address something that in nanoptics is very important that is not standardly done in, in classical nanoptics. You take account of quantum size effects of how the electron gas responds uh, when it's quantum confinement, non-local interactions, so it's not epsilon of omega, it's, it's epsilon of Q and omega, right? It's non-local description. The spill out, which is so important in the cavity, Atomistic effects later, not in this gillium kind of description, and electron tunneling. Okay? And that's what I'm going to show you. I suggest that because it's half time, I, you need to, uh, one minute of rest. So I suggest that you take the person you have on the right and you tell them something. <laughs> that, uh, well, uh, do, did you understand everything or what? <laughs> you just talk to yourself. Or whatever, just one minute to, to comment if you got everything or if something is not clear or... Can I ask you a Yeah, sure. Okay, um, I will put myself to the right, so you can talk to the right. <laughs> <laughs> so you claim that the, uh, when the surface is infinitely big and you won't cover the light and the problem, but the, in this configuration you have a, a pen and you have an SCM tip. And these two subjects can be regarded as infinitely big. Now, yeah. In that case, you can cover the light and, and the Yeah, but the, the once you go large enough, you lose, you get to a kind of a saturation of the spread of the charge, and what matters is where you localize in the cavity. Okay, so once you make your tip micron size or whatever, or centimeter size, it doesn't matter anymore what happens there. Uh -huh. You still localize the plasmon in the cavity. But the charge, the compensating charge, is spread along the long walls of the tip, so to say. Oh, okay. There's a point where if you make it longer, it's so little charge that it doesn't matter how it spreads along the big, big wall. What matters is the localization in the gap. Okay. I, I have a question. So how do you, uh, I found the heating effect you, in the junction. The heating effect where? In a classical description or? In a nano, in practice, when you apply laser to a nano gap, you heat. Yeah. Which, uh, here in our description, that heat comes through a phenomenological damping, right, in the imaginary part of the dielectric function, which is intrinsic losses. That's the, and that's the heat, so to say, right? But in practice, if you come with your laser, 
we know what is the damping, but if you come with your laser continuously and, and it's heating, 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 you, you melt. Okay? Yes. But we incorporate in the classical description through the phenomenological damping, and that gives you a little bit of phonon, the intrinsic losses. Can you put some number over there? So let's say you separate light, so what do you need there? In size and plasma frequency? Yeah, you come with, let's say, 633 or whatever, yes. And uh, you would need typically a gold or silver, which have plasma frequency, which are not exactly free electron gas. It's free electron gas plus a little bit of interband. And it puts the, the collective oscillation, the one you want in, in the visible. If you use, for example, sodium or aluminum, it goes to the ultraviolet. So that's not useful for optics. So for optics, that's why people use gold and silver, typically. So you will see that in many experiments, people use a silver surface and silver tip. That's very good. It's very little lossy. Mm -hmm. But typically, in plasmonic materials, standard plasmonic materials are gold and silver because it puts the resonances in the right place. And the dimension of the, of the dots? Yeah, but you can, I mean, you have in a, in a tip, STM tip, you have the tip and the surface is, is massive, right? But then you have also 100 nanometer particle with another 100 nanometer particle. So 20 nanometers with 20 nanometers. That's the kind of range nanometer scale. But again, a tip, an STM tip or, or a particle or, or an electrode in the very ends of the electrodes connecting molecules, that's the kind of thing you have. But, but of course, an, electro, an electrode is also more realistic, more dirty in the sense of the metal, right? When, when it becomes larger and larger, it's very rough. Okay, so we continue. I will have to renormalize a lot, but it's just okay. <laughs> so, so I, but, but this is interesting because it's conduction, right? So when you do classical Maxwell equations of this antenna cavity, this is exactly what I showed you before, but this, again, may be confusing because now here is electron volts, it's energy. Before I show you wavelength, it's the inverse. So this is the bonding dimer plasmon, our cavity, localized plasmon, and when we make it closer and closer, now it's nanometer, half a nanometer, Maxwell equations, classical Maxwell equations, would give you this kind of behavior. So, so you are, it's kind of divergent, right? It's, you are putting the particle, the, the electrodes closer and closer and closer together. You are confining the, the, char the electromagnetic field more and more. And of course, the, the electromagnetic, the charge potential, if you put yourself on top, is infinity, right? So this is this divergence here. And then attaching, then charge transfer emerges with a much lower energy plasma, right? But now, if we do this quantum mechanical calculation of the same situation with the same electron density, the same sizes, everything equal, but you adopt the time-dependent density functional theory to address the optical response, again, the dipole, Fourier transform, and we get the resonance, this is what we get. It's exactly the same calculation, not the same calculation, the same uh, configuration, same electron density, we have the bonding diamond plasma for large separation distance, classical and quantum give the same, but as you get to about half a nanometer, this bonding di dimer plasmon, this gap plasmon, is quenched. Why? It's very simple. When they are very separated, you come with your optical pulse, the optical potential changes, nobody cares. When they are close to each other, close enough, half a nanometer, both electrodes are like this, but now the optical pulse comes and the Fermi levels start dancing following the optical potential, right, very fast at femtosecond. And then when you have your Fermi level like that, close enough, electrons will tunnel forth and back, forth and back. So you will have conduction at optical frequency, tunneling at optical frequencies that quenches this mode. If you have current, you kill the field. If you kill the field, you kill the resonance. And the charge transfer plasmon emerges even larger here, okay? So if you put yourself on the cavity, the classical calculation, again, will give a divergence. I put 100 here, but it goes to 1,000, 1 million if you want, as close as you put, right? I don't put zero here because it diverges. If you do the quantum mechanical model, you rise, you, you lift this uh, unphysical divergence, and then you see how the cavity plasmon and the enhancement in the field, when the tunneling at optical frequencies is triggered out, it kills the charge density. So, for a spectroscopy, if now you have a molecule 
And on top of transport, you want to do optics or Raman or fluorescence, you need to be careful to be here and not to be here because you might get to quench. So that's why, and Guillaume will tell you, it's not a spoiler, but sometimes in STM they put one or two or three layers of sodium chloride to lift the molecule a little bit from the metal, otherwise they quench the signal. That's the reason why. And we actually, well, I'm, I'm going to skip this. We, we kind of identify via this connection of the tips this quantum regime, right? In the experiment, Jeremy Baumberg, we saw the quenching of the plasmon and, and blue shift. And when you do the classical, you don't get anything, and it's just when you do the quantum. That don't get, this is just a, an experimental confirmation of this kind of quantum regime, right? Okay. Let me go quickly through this. So far, I have done light in, light out. No DC, no, no current. Uh, just, just tunneling at optical frequencies. But in this plasmonic cavity, now there are a lot of possibilities. One of them is to come with light in and produce current. Just without molecules, just in the cavity. This is what is called photoemission, right? You have this gap. This is something we have done recently with uh, people from ultrafast. They come with a pulse, a single cycle optical pulse. They can place with the inside carrier envelope phase. This is the kind of pulse, very fast. This is femtoseconds. And now you kind of photoemit, produce this photoemission of the electrons, and the photoemission of electrons will follow pretty much the carrier envelope phase of this pulse. And you will have, depending on the size of the gap and the intensity of the pulse, you will have a very complex dynamics of the electrons that will give a final current, right? If you, this is the kind of situation, you come the pulse here, which is positive and negative, and then this makes the Fermi levels to oscillate, and then the electrons are ejected and quiver depending on the pulse, okay? This is, at the same time, pulse, potential landscape, and emission of electrons. Again, the pulse comes here, and femtosecond, the potentials change, so the electrons come here, the electrons are jumping, some of them, the polarization changes and quiver, then the others one and jumping, so this is in time, you just need to integrate this in time to get the current. And this quiver of electrons, this is actually very novel, to be able to to follow the electron dynamics with this time dependent density functional calculations within a gap. This is, a, this is not a tunneling gap, this is a bit larger, okay? It's four or five. This is kind of fowler norheim kind of uh, situation for, for, for the conduction community. And then this quiver amplitude depends again on the intensity and the frequency, right? So this is the kind of phenomenology we have. This is our theoretical calculations, right? This, is, this pulse produces this kind of burst of current which is a sm a smaller in time than femtoseconds, so you have like attosecond bursts of current, but because this is a repetition rate, you can produce a DC current in this way, right? This is, just for, for, for the experimentalists here, this is the kind of thing that uh, Albert Leitenstoffer does in Constance here, and uh, they have this kind of bow tie, this is the plasmonic gap, they come with the pulses, actually two identical pulses with a delay, and now they can measure the correlation of the currents here as a function of delay and as a function of the carrier envelope phase. This is pretty much the experiment I just mentioned. As a function of delay and as a function of carrier envelope phase, you have this burst. If you cut here, you will have the burst of current, which is below one femtosecond. So this is really attosecond dynamics, and these are correlations of, of currents. I just wanted to share it very quickly. If you have questions, then. I can answer later or in the coffee break. It's more complex, right? Now it's uh, when I think it's, it becomes one of the most important aspects of the talk when it comes to understand resolution that will be extended by Guillaume later, right? So far, all I have said we're connected with a smooth surfaces, right? A smooth meta. Even if you do a quantum mechanical treatment of the response, the quantum mechanical treatment was a, a gilium, a smooth gilium, so to say. So it lacks the features of the atomistic. Uh, uh, landscape, right? In other words, for us, classically or quantically, this is a smooth, so to say. Now, the question is, when we start playing with molecules at this scale, what happens with the atomistic description, right? And for that, uh, like three or four years ago, well, actually, maybe I... I, I are you going to show this? No. No, okay. So, why we started to think about this is because of this experimental breakthrough of six years ago in Hefe, right? Which is this situation. It's the tip, conductive, a molecule here. They come with light in. They check the vibrations of the molecule with the Raman photons out. They move the tip. 
and they obtain all these vibrational fingerprints that when they scan, resolve the molecular fingerprints within sub-molecular resolution rate. And at that time, six years ago, we were not able to reproduce this with a standard plasmonics. I have, seen you that, I have shown you that plasmonics concentrates light down to five, 10 nanometers the best. If you get too closer, it spans. So we didn't know, I mean, we made some preliminary calculations, but we didn't know what was the source of atomic resolution with optics, not with currents, but with optics, light in, light out. So all this is what made us to think of this level of uh, structuring of the cavity, providing some kind of uh, optical resolution, atomic scale optical resolution. Right? So Daniel Sanchez Portal, who is an expert in all using the siesta code, for those of you who know time-dependent DFT, uh, in frequency uh, perturbative method, he can calculate these kind of clusters with facets, tips, protrusions, and that's exactly what he did. He compared, or together with one student we were supervising together, this Gillium quantum calculation of a smooth particle. This could be a cavity, but it's, it's a resonator. And the same one with the same electron density for this atomistic distribution. And what we saw is something that for the time-dependent DFT community might be trivial, right? Is this charge density at these optical frequencies. But for us, it was uh, really amazing. At these atomic protrusions, you had this extra two, three, four, sometimes five times enhancement of the field. On top of the plasmonic field, on top of this plasmonic field, you have this extra enhancement at the atomic protrusions. So photons are trapped somehow in the vicinity of one or two single atoms for a very short time, but they are there. And then we calculated for this cavity with this atomistic protrusion as a function of separation distance, the effective mode volume. That's why I told you about the effective mode volume, because it's so important, right? And the effective mode volume that you get for this kind of, this is the blue one, the tip to facet. This is a tip, we call this tip to facet. We also try tip to tip, we try facet to facet. Here, the one shown here is the blue one, tip to facet. And you see that you get to effective mode volumes below one cubic nanometer. So light is being trapped at the almost single atom level. This is full state-of-the-art time-dependent DFT calculations. And it can be wrong, and there can be something else, but most likely the photons are trapped there, right? And now with this localization, and assuming this level of localization, at the, the same way you say that the current goes out from these two or three atoms, in optics, the ultimate limit of localization are also those two or three atoms. Sometimes it's just a factor of three or four enhancement, no more. That's all one atom can give, but that's enough to be revealing the spectroscopy with a factor of two orders of magnitude, because it goes to the square. Okay. And now, with this level of localization, we manage to do in the cavity the full recovering of this spectral resolution submolecular, which with optics, no current. So current is just a reference, right? Okay, I have 10 more minutes. So in 10 more minutes, I, let me just share a couple of things. Uh, we have done also kind of relaxation. When you do relaxation, let me show you. Now you know what is charge transfer, what is bonding dimer plasmon. If we clap the, the junction and now we make it, we stretch it little by little, this is the kind of situations we have. And we see in the optics, this kind of jumps in the intensity and in the, res in the resonances, which are connected also with electronic states form, right? So you are making here a stretching, tracting, and you're producing like this kind of a stationary, you can see, right? Red, blue, red, blue, now blue, red, blue, red. So you are creating this kind of conductance channels that are reflected in the optics. This actually is an experiment that nobody has done, but I think it would be very interesting to see this kind of conductance at the same time, the spectroscopy to detect this kind of jumps in the, in the conductance. Anyway, okay. I think I'm going to skip this, this transport uh, thing at optical frequencies. And uh, it just involves how we address junction, molecular junctions when we come with light, light in and light out, and how from the spectroscopy we can get information of the, of the conductance at optical uh, frequencies just by checking the spectral shifts. You have seen how by having charge transfer or not having charge transfer, you shift the frequency of your peaks. So now you measure the shift of your frequency of the peaks and you know how much conductance there is. So it's an indirect way of measuring the conductance at optical frequencies of a molecule. This 
just very quickly, we did with these two types of molecules. This is non-conductive, this is conductive. Jeremy Baumber did the experiment. You put this uh, biphenyl dithiol here, this with the wind tile here, and then you see that when you have one, the spectroscopy, light in, light out, gives the resonance here. When you have the, the non-conductive is here. So there's a, a redshift, a blue shift here when you don't have no conductive. And that, checking this jump, you can see how much conductance you have through this, okay? I don't have more time. It's actually basically, again, right? It's a screening, the, you, are, you are screening the charge, the bonding dimer plasma on the cavity gap, and by screening this, you can get a relationship between the screening of the charge and the frequency shift. And that gives you, here, for example, we, we obtain that uh, we have like about 200 molecules and each molecule have a conductance of about 0.70 G naught, okay? Just for you to know. This is what I wanted to discuss in the last 10 minutes, and this I will leave for, for Guillaume. So plasmon exciton coupling, right? This is the situation, actually all that that I have explained, we, we did in the end for this, to obtain more efficiently information on the molecular excitations. Now we forget about vibrations, we do the excitons, okay? An exciton is nothing but a dipole here, right? A dipole located in the vicinity of a local field, right? That's what I'm going to say. This is the excitonic emission. This is the plasmon, which are decay kappa. This is the decay of the plasmon. This is the decay of the, of the exciton of the molecule. And we put this exciton in our optical resonator, which is a plasmon. So these guys, the plasmon field and the exciton, interact. The best way to describe this interaction is through the local field of the plasmon and the dipolar moment, okay? How we address the energy of this interaction, very easy. The energy of this interaction is the product of the dipolar moment in that local field at that point, right? Everybody follows? So sometimes this energy of interaction, we call it coupling energy or coupling strength or coupling rate. Again, it's the same, right? It's an energy, it's a coupling rate. And all we need to know is how strong or how large this coupling strength is. Obviously, it will be larger if the dipolar moment of the exciton is larger or if the local field is very large, right? So that the scalar product of both is large, right? So we can distinguish in that, in that interaction then two regimes. And you will hear in the literature very often talking about weak coupling regime. The weak coupling regime says that this interaction energy between the exciton dipole and the local plasmon is weak, okay? It's not fast enough. When they want to start talking to each other, the plasmon has already de de decay or the exciton has already decay. So if the coupling strength or energy or decay rate, the interaction rate is slower than the decay of the plasmon or the decay of the exciton, the both excitations, you don't have time to interact. This is the weak coupling. In energy, in the energy landscape, this is just like kind of an interference between the optical mode and the exciton. So you have what you call even phano-like profiles in the spectrum, right? This is like a continuum because it's broader. The exciton is uh, narrower. So you will have a continuum coupled to a discrete structure. You will have phano kind of thing in the energy, okay? And this is what we, in the time domain we call parcel effect. The optical resonator will accelerate the emission, but it won't change the energy landscape. The other um, energy re regime is the strong coupling. In the strong coupling, this energy rate, this energy interaction is large. It's very fast. So the exciton and the plasmon talk to each other very fast before any of them decays. This is the strong coupling. The consequences for this in the energy landscape is that both the optical resonator, the plasmon, and the exciton are not anymore two different excitations. They bind, they hybridize, and they create this kind of polaritonic, lower and upper polaritonic solution. The, the state is not anymore a plasmonic state or an excitonic state. It's kind of a mixed hybridized state. It's, that's in the energy landscape. In time domain, you would have the Rabi oscillation because the state is kind of jumping between one and another, okay? This is the summary of what I have just said. The coupling rate in the weak coupling regime, in the, in the frequency domain, you will have just parcel factor, broadening. The plasmon makes the exciton to emit faster, parcel effect. 
in the time domain, you will have just an acceleration of the emission. Okay? <coughs> this is the normal emission when you put it in the plasmon, and this is what we call weak coupling energy. So sometimes when I hear some talks, in this strong coupling effect, in this strong coupling regime, the parcel factor, the parcel factor makes no sense in a strong coupling. This is weak coupling. If it's parcel factor, it's weak coupling. Okay? Never use parcel effect for a strong coupling. Because in a strong coupling, you have polaritonic split. This is the lower upper polariton. So in the spectrum, you will see the, the split. Now you don't have any more the plasmon, you don't have the, the exciton, you have a split, hybridized solution. And in the, in the time domain, you will have this Rabi oscillation. This is not parcel effect, this is Rabi oscillations. This is parcel effect, which is weak coupling, okay? This is a tutorial, right? Sorry, I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> so maybe 90% of you know this, but... So let me show you just two examples of this strong uh, light matter interaction in this conduction configuration, right? Again, the tip, this is the experiments of the, of the Chinese group. A silver tip, again, you, you see plasmonic uh, material, silver, silver. We have this thing, talocyanine, that we have here some calculations about. And now, the nice thing about the tip, the STM tip, is that you can move the tip laterally, and you, with that, you are moving the, the plasmonic cavity, right? And you can make the molecule closer to the plasmonic cavity or farther. Interacting more or interacting less. These are the, the three positions I put here, right? So let's put the tip very far from the molecule. We just put the bias and check the light emission, which is a spectral fingerprint of the plasmonic cavity here. If we don't have the molecule, we just have the plasmon, then this is the light emission from the plasmon. No molecule, just the tip. This is the, pl this is the plasmon, the localized plasmon in the cavity, okay? Emitted, driven by the current. If you put yourself with the tip on top of the molecule and you excite the dipolar exciton of the molecule and emit, then you have the exciton emi emission, right? This is the excitonic emission of your molecule, right? And now if you put in between, in the red, with this kind of interaction between exciton and plasmon, look at what you get. It's beautiful, right? It's a perfect interference. This is a funnel profile, right? It's the broadband plasmon interacting, interfering with the discrete emission of the, of the exciton, creating this interference, weak coupling funnel emission. At a single molecule level, single exciton level, okay? And why this is weak? A lot of people were asking me, why this is weak? We have a very strong dipole of a very good emitter. These talocyanins emit very well. We have a very intense field localized in the nanoscale, almost at the atomic scale, you cannot have more than that. How, if you don't get a strong coupling and polaritonic splitting with this, where and when are you going to get it? So anybody can figure out why do we have weak coupling regime here and not strong coupling? And the answer is very easy when we see this. The coupling energy, the coupling rate, is the scalar product of the local field acting on this dipole. And it's the scalar product. These porphyrins have the dipole on top of the surface, and the local field is like this. So the scalar product is very small. It's not purely orthogonal, so it's not zero, but this gives weak coupling. You would get a strong coupling if you manage to align your dipole with the local field. This is what Jeremy Baumber did in his particle on a mirror configuration here. He put this metal in bloom with the dipole kind of point, pointing up. He, he just put it in this barrel, this cucurbituril, for those of you who do chemistry, cucurbituril. And now he puts this dipole here, close to the local field, parallel, and then he gets perfect polaritonic split. This is a strong coupling, okay? It's the kind of the interference taken to the limit, okay? With two polaritonic branches, okay? And in the last minute, what I wanted to flash you is, is the following. All I have told you is very simple. People in optics, we are very simple compared to you guys. I, I really mean it because I see all these transport calculations with quantum chemistry, very sophisticated things. And for years and years and decades in optics, what we have done to, to address these issues is to say that the exciton is a point dipole. So we were putting here, in a, this can be a cavity, an antenna, our point dipole. You get your field, it can be a cavity, your point dipole. And actually, when you put the actual molecule, the, the actual molecule is not a point dipole at all, right? 
is, ex is, is extended. If you have a, an extended illumination, it doesn't matter. But when you have this strongly inhomogeneous plasmonic illumination, the interaction between the exciton, the quantum chemistry of the exciton, and the inhomogeneous field, in other words, the electronic states convoluted with the photonic states can give very different. So and with this unfinished, so instead of using the coupling and addressing the coupling in this way with a point dipole, what we did with Thomas Newman, one of my former students, is to calculate the whole quantum chemistry, the electronic transition rates in a space, distribution in a space, the plasmonic fields in a space convolute and get new, new, new coupling strengths. This is the, the dipole compared to this, and this is the, the, couple, the mapping of the coupling strengths of this tip, this plasmonic tip that moves around the dipole. You can see in the point dipole, much, le, much less, uh, twice the value compared to this, and actually break of uh, circular symmetry. When you do the full quantum chemistry with the distribution of photonic states, you get the four lobes, the right values. So this is a way to incorporate quantum chemistry, optics, and Guillaume will show you what happens when you actually put the electrons here and you couple also the, the excitation rate with this emission rate. Right? And I think uh, I'm going to... That's pretty good. This is what Guillaume will tell you about. I told you that I will skip it, right? I wanted to acknowledge, in this, even if it's a tutorial, the last part, Thomas Newman, which was a key person, the photon emission from Gary Koch. This was more state-of-the-art last results. Martin Urvieta in the Pico cavities and Ruben Esteban, uh, my collaborator as well. And, and pretty much... Just to finish, um, I think that this tutorial was kind of complementary to all you are doing, right? In the end of the day, what we are improving right now is all this coupling of photons, vibrations, electron hole pairs, nanoantenna resonance, with a more precise quantum chemistry of the molecules and uh, interacting with electron currents, right? So, so far we have partially addressed some of these issues, but to address it all, you know that even without photons, it's very complicated, but if you put already photons there is even it's even more complicated right so thank you